Last year, uh, in an interview um, when stepping down as the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights, uh, Navi pointed out that she had been working non-stop for uh, pretty much 50 years and she had um, looked forward to returning to Durban to go back to um, her garden uh, and to um, uh, have uh, a life once again, but that she would always be a human rights defender. Now, I'm not sure how much time she spent um, in her garden since stepping down last year. I suspect not very much from the conversations I've had today in terms of, of the invitations um, that she's had. But in those 50 years, <clears throat> Navi has been at the crucible of many of the world's most intractable uh, conflicts, some of which are now in a post-conflict phase, uh, and many of others of which remain uh, unresolved. And from her own experience, um, first of all, her personal experience in, in apartheid South Africa as a young lawyer and subsequently as a high court judge, and then subsequently as the president of, uh, as a member, or rather, and the president of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and a judge at the International Criminal Court, and subsequently spending six years as the High Commissioner for Human Rights, it seems to me there's no one better placed to speak on the interface between human rights, its institutions, and the... <coughs> excuse me, human rights, its institutions, and the workings of international politics. But I think it also should be remembered that Navi has been uh, a champion of gender uh, rights, of issues around sexual orientation, and also around issues of social and economic rights. Um, so we are delighted that Navi has been able to join us in Belfast today. The event will commence with uh, the introduction from the Lord Chief Justice, followed by Navi's speech, and then uh, we will have time for uh, a Q&A, and then I hope you'll be able to stay for the reception. So I hope you enjoy this afternoon, and without further ado, I'm delighted to ask Sir Declan Morgan to introduce Navi Pillay. Thank you. I'm uh, grateful to the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission for the invitation to join you today for this inaugural event. And I'm delighted that we are able to welcome uh, such a distinguished guest as Navi Pillay. Uh, she has been a tireless campaigner for equality, both in her native uh, South Africa and on the international stage. And her personal contribution towards tackling all forms of discrimination has been both significant and inspiring. And one of the most striking features of her varied and interesting career is that it includes a series of firsts. She was the first South African to obtain a doctorate in law from Harvard Law School, the first non-white woman to open her own law practice in Natal province, and the first non-white female judge of the High Court of South Africa. And these achievements, no doubt as a result of the hard work that Les has uh, referred to, uh, and dedication make her a positive role model both for women and for unrepresent, underrepresented groups across society. And that's of some significance in relation to work that I do because in my role, particularly as chairman of the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission, I value diversity and I'm committed to achieving a judiciary that is as reflective as possible of the community it serves. And through the Commission's programme of action, we have held a number of outreach events and kept data on the composition of the Northern Ireland judiciary under active review. In overall terms, our judiciary is currently reflective of the community it serves in terms of community background. We are reasonably close to reflecting the representation in the population of minority ethnic groups. And our figures for those who have declared a disability are similar to those recorded for other forms of employment, though these are both areas where I believe further attention is required to keep pace with our changing demographics. The overall gender breakdown of 57% male and 43% female compares reasonably well with the economically active population, 
though there is still room for improvement in the representation of women in salary judicial office, particularly at the most senior levels. And I'm hoping that we may soon be able to do something about that. To this end, um, I have established a joint liaison committee involving senior representatives of the Bar Council and Law Society. And the committee has brought forward a number of initiatives, including the Women in Law seminar series and a mentoring scheme, which is ongoing. The Commission has also been looking critically at its processes and policies to ensure that there are no unintended barriers to applications for women, and we have been exploring opportunities for flexible working, particularly at the most senior levels, including the High Court. I am hopeful that these measures will yield tangible results in the not-too-distant future. Most recently, of course, Navi served as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2008 until 2014. In the United Kingdom, the transposition into domestic law of significant elements of the European Convention on Human Rights in the form of the 1998 Act has had a dramatic effect on the relationship between the courts, the executive and the legislature and meant that any interference with a right protected by the Convention will engage the involvement of the Court. Part of the role of the Court, indeed, is to secure the appropriate balance between the three arms of government at any given time. We live in a dynamic world, and the balance will always be susceptible to changing events. I spoke about this recently at an event in Galway, at which I used recent judgments of the UK Supreme Court, which determined the course of social policy in the controversial areas of assisted suicide and freedom of expression in connection with um, national security to illustrate where the balance now sits in this jurisdiction. I do not have time this evening to explore the many complex issues that these cases and others like them have raised but one of the most important points that they have highlighted is that such cases would not even have been entertained by the House of Lords 15 years ago. Since then, cases involving allegations of an interference with qualified rights have resulted in the review and revision of the proportionality test used by the courts to determine where the balance should rest between the interests of the citizen and the public interest. As well as scrutinizing the evidence this test requires the court to recognise the evidential weight that should be accorded to decision makers with special institutional competence, recognising that executive decision making is constitutionally for the executive and not for the courts. Ultimately, of course, the, the exercise of the court's task of securing balance must be firmly rooted in the principal objective of securing public confidence in the administration of justice. The balance that is struck between the arms of government will, of course, vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and how each jurisdiction responds to a changing world is largely determined by whether or not it has a written constitution. An example of this is the recent referendum in the Republic of Ireland on the issue of marriage equality. Within the United Kingdom, the Conservative Party's manifesto commitment to abolish the 1998 Act and replace it with a Bill of Rights has fueled a renewed debate on how human rights should be protected and the balance between the competing rights of the individual, identifiable groups and the state. The shift in the new United Kingdom government's position on the matter only serves to demonstrate how dynamic a political and legal world we live in and we will all be watching with interest to see what, if anything, unfolds. How timely it is, therefore, to have Navi with us, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing her reflections on the evolution of constitutional jurisprudence in relation to human rights and how this has interacted with global political considerations. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Navi Tilly, having set the agenda for what she has to say. Thank you, Chief Justice. That was a very kind uh, introduction. Um, 
I want to salute you for supporting the principle of addressing the gender imbalance on the bench here. I think that, in fact, you're worse than Mauritania and Saudi Arabia for not having women on the bench. Um, I want to thank the National Human Rights Commission of Northern Ireland. This is a long delayed visit. That invitation was, it was addressed to me when I was High Commissioner for Human Rights. I'm, uh, I've retired now for nine months. So if you hear me speaking too much about I, we, and so on, please remember it's former uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights. I don't have the powers, but I'm still speaking out on issues. Um, I feel particularly close to this body because we are all lawyers and, and judges. Uh, I was a lawyer myself for almost 30 years in South Africa, and it was such a struggle uh, fighting cases in, in a courtroom where the judges took the position of applying the law positively as it stood. Uh, I uh, once had to go to uh, Zambia to see witnesses, and I was given a passport for four days. So we whipped in there and back, and one of the uh, exiles I met gave me a record of Irish revolutionary songs, well, freedom, um, uh, freedom and folk songs. It was so moving, especially the one on We Shall Overcome. So th this was in early 1970s. And uh, as a lawyer, then I had an opportunity to go to Robben Island Prison to visit my own <laughs> clients. And so tucked into another innocuous sleeve, this record got to them on the island as well. Um, so I want to thank the Irish people for supporting us in our struggle. And I'm here also to salute the tremendous development that has taken place here and very gently point to areas that probably need more attention. I uh, had not applied for the position of High Commissioner for Human Rights. In fact, I had to resign as a judge on, from the International Criminal Court to take up this appointment. So let me tell you what some others have said. <laughs> Ambassadors said to me, it's very appropriate to have a judge as a High Commissioner for Human Rights, even though I'm not judging any longer. I'm an advocate and seeking uh, changes and advances in the protection of human rights, however small. That was a big mind change for me from working as an attorney in South Africa because we wanted all and immediately. Uh, so what the ambassador said to me is, what's good about you is that you are a judge and you listen. So taking the heed of the other person's point of view and presenting a balanced picture uh, got us a long way to uh, maintain the dialogue. The Secretary General also said to me, well, in, towards the close of my term, now I understand about something about judges, and that is you stick to principles. It happened because the Iranian foreign minister had asked me repeatedly to visit Iran. And I said, well, I won't be wearing a headscarf. And he said, but that's a law of the land. It's exactly like you have to drive on the right-hand side of the road. Everybody has to obey the law. And I said, I, it's a very law that I'm attacking. You change that law, and then I would come. And so then he went to the Secretary General, who who advised me to buy a, a designer French scarf, put it on my head, uh, and go. And um, because Mary Robinson had worn, a, had covered her head, so had Louise Arbour, and some ministers in the French parliament who wore the designer scarves, apparently. And that's when I told him, this is about discrimination against women. This is about imposing a religion on me. I my job is to uphold UN standards. So if I go and compromise, what am I doing to, the, to all the people who want to follow UN standards? So that's a little bit of my legal experience and judicial experience. I do think that the, there is room for many more judges to be working in the UN. But as you also know, it's dominated by politicians. 
um, Les and I arranged that I would speak for about 20 minutes and then and then we can have our open dialogue because I'm not uh, certain, of course, what your areas of uh, interest are and what you'd like me to address you on. So, as I said, I had no idea about the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights or the Human Rights Council in Geneva because I was functioning in the courtroom. Um, and so I thought I will uh, explain some of the challenges I, that faced me when I first started. Plenty of advice, of course, from very many member states. Uh, one powerful country did not approve of my support for women's reproductive rights and wanted an assurance that I would not influence my office with this approach. Um, I got a call from the Secretary General's chef de cabinet who said they had given this assurance on my behalf and so could I now just set it out in writing. They'll just keep it in a little drawer, they won't use it. Um, and I, of course, declined, said there's no way I'm going to give you an undertaking that I won't uh, introduce progressive ideas to the Human Rights Council. And so I went on to, to assert the reproductive rights of women as a human right publicly, and I joined the UN Population uh, Organization, UNFPA's campaign to educate and promote the right to reproductive health. And, and of course, I hope that um, the protection of women here in Ireland will extend to uh, respecting the, the choice of women. There is a pushback on these particular rights in the UN right now. This happened at the um, CSW, the Center for the, the Committee on the Status of Women, which is an intergovernmental body. It happened at re meetings of UN women chaired by the, the current uh, president of Chile, who was the head of UN women. And um, also at the um, People are afraid to hold a follow-up conference to the Beijing World Conference on Women or the Cairo Population Conference because civil society is afraid of losing the gains they achieved. So it's still a, a challenge then uh, within the uh, United Nations organizations, but particularly member states on this issue. I, I just raised that first to say that the High Commissioner for Human Rights had to deal with all human rights of all persons um, and not select one or other or grade them as important. And when I began, I was also told by some state representatives not to name any states for criticism in my address before the UN uh, Human Rights Council, General Assembly, and so on. Uh, and they said this was because it's an intrusion into state sovereignty and I was um, interfering in the internal matters of a country. But I felt it was not possible to pinpoint violations of human rights or even gains in protection of human rights if I did not mention the country concern. So I started off quietly by singling out a few countries where it was necessary to do so. And by the end of my term, I uh, had included comments on about 54 countries, and it was accepted. It came from me and it was accepted. A few of the developed countries were surprised and objected to me shining the lens on their backyards because they said I should be um, focusing on very serious issues, the killing of thousands of people in conflicts in other parts of the world rather than asking them to ensure equal rights for groups such as the Roma, the Sinti, and the Travelers. But as I said, all human rights are important, and they cannot be graded for importance. So as lawyers understand, you, you challenge an issue in court, you win or lose step by step. There you are, I covered the spectrum of states, because no country has a perfect human rights record. Um, every country has issues that need to be addressed. I also found 
in the Human Rights Council that there was a skewed emphasis, also in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, a skewed emphasis on civil and political rights to the detriment of addressing economic, social, and cultural rights and the right to development. The right to development is explicitly stated in the mandate provided to the High Commissioner for Human Rights by the General Assembly resolution. And this complaint obviously was raised by many developing countries uh, in the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, and I thought it was a valid position and I proceeded to rectify this. There was resistance to this initially from those who considered that economic rights and the right to development were not rights, but aspirations. Human rights protects both freedom from fear, civil and political rights, and freedom from want, economic, social, and cultural rights. That's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we then, over six years, have come a long way to pushing for the rights based on the Rio outcome and the post-2015 development agenda and for the recognition of the right to food, the right to water, the right to health. So when I started in 2008, there was huge resistance to naming these as rights, um, including from my dear friend, the head of World Health Organization, who was too afraid to call it right to health. And by the time I left, she was giving me lectures on why health is a human right. Now, of course, I don't blame her. her, her she was bound by the uh, positions adopted by her board. The same member states who passed the entire spectrum of uh, human rights laws and are parties to these covenants. So the right to water is very important, and the right to, to eradicate poverty is clearly of crucial concern. So I'm pleased that uh, the South African Constitutional Court, based on the fact that we have an equality clause. I've spoken to many universities in um, the United States where students were very surprised when I informed them that they didn't have the right to equality in their constitution. They have right to equal opportunities, but not right to equality. So the South African Constitutional Court, relying on that, and also a provision in our constitution that where there's a gap they can refer to international norms and standards. Uh, and, and despite the fact that South Africa is not a party to the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, the South African Constitutional Court first spelt out the right to housing and then proceeded to, with, with regard to AIDS medication, ordered the government to provide AIDS antiretroviral medication to aid sufferers. And, and this in turn also led to litigation which opened up uh, generic medicines, <coughs> the manufacture of generic medicines, so important for developing states. So I truly respect and am in awe of uh, the changes that courts of law can bring. So Chief Justice, I listened very carefully to some of the cases that you underlined. And, um, and want to say that these are very, very good examples. And I, I, I lost my power as High Commissioner, but not my voice. So I will uh, communicate both my court's decisions and the attempts you are making to deliver on economic and social rights. Um, now, a similar prohibition was asserted by states against me addressing the issue of uh, homosexuality, LGBTI rights, and a strong group of states accused me of creating new rights and not adhering to internationally agreed rights. So congratulations to Ireland, for uh, the people of Ireland for adopting the ref the referendum you have on same-sex marriage. Now, here again, our persistence led to the United Nations addressing the issue of violence and discrimination against LGBTI persons for the very first time. So two studies have been done 
and the U United Nations resolutions commissioned these worldwide studies against homophobia as a human rights violation. Now, combating impunity and strengthening accountability, the rule of law, and promoting democratic society underpins all the activities undertaken by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in the exercise of this very unique mandate given to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So the office continues to play a major role in supporting the development and monitoring of human rights norms and standards by the human rights mechanisms. By these, I mean the Human Rights Council, which has a procedure called Universal Periodic Review, the human rights record of every country, including Ireland, is reviewed by the other states, and they make recommendations. The High Commissioner provides a report on the human rights situation. NGOs participate, and national human rights commissions with A status can participate in these proceedings. It's webcast, it's public, and the whole goal is not just to criticize, but to help states and civil society implement these recommendations made by other states. And I was truly surprised that that was happening, that states voluntarily uh, produce their human rights uh, record to be scrutinized by others, and they accept many of the recommendations <coughs> made to them. The, uh, other human rights mechanisms are the special procedures. These are about 50 or 55 independent experts, mainly academics, but they are lawyers as well, who have expertise in their area. They could be thematic issues, such as uh, eradicating poverty or torture or freedom of speech, or they could be country-specific, such as an expert mandate holder watching the situation in um, Iran, South Sudan, and, the, and North Korea. These individuals visit states, they uh, produce reports, and they make recommendations as well. Now, my calls for accountability or referral by the Security Council to the International Criminal Court for investigation of uh, suspected serious crimes met with resistance by some, mainly from the countries concerned. The Syrian ambassador called me a lunatic. Um, the, the thing is, we do occupy the moral high ground when we assert these are the obligations that you undertook when you signed up to this convention. Um, I was told I was exceeding my mandate, that it was a violation of state sovereignty and an interference in the internal affairs of a country, or, where, or that these were matters for political resolution, not human rights scrutiny. And this would be the reaction each time I encourage the Human Rights Council to hold urgent debates or special sessions on specific country situations, and these include the Israeli military operations, in the occupied Palestinian territory in Gaza, the situation, the conflict in Syria, Libya, Sri Lanka, DPRK, and Eritrea. I should not forget to mention that my first and biggest challenge was to serve as Secretariat for the Review Conference of the 2001 Durban World Conference on Racism and its outcome document, DDPA. Of course, 9-11 happened two days after that good document was adopted, but the conference itself was uh, controversial. As you know, Colin Powell led the US delegate out, and Israel felt very hurt and angry at some of the anti-Semitic remarks that came from both the official uh, representatives and from civil society organizations. But the interesting thing which I picked up later is that the foreign minister then of Israel wrote on his uh, website that that conference and the 
outcome document, DDPA, was a success for Israel because it uh, condemned anti-Semitism as well. And yet, for eight years after that, uh, the entire situation was changed by virulent propaganda saying that this uh, Durban conference was against Israel. So when the review conference was held in Geneva, um, President Obama, who had newly taken office, announced that he was not participating in this conference. And seven European states, including Australia, followed like a ratchet effect. They all withdrew uh, from the, this conference, except Ireland, I must say, uh, the Irish ambassador made uh, a very profound statement on addressing racism, racial discrimination. Uh, so that was my biggest challenge, and I only realized that my predecessor did not stand for an, an extended term because of, of that conference. It was so highly political. The importance of such a conference and one of its outcomes was that we held uh, regional workshops in five regions of the United Nations to address the other pesky issue of defamation of religion constantly raised by Arab states. So we had to convince them that you can't defame a religion. It's individuals who s may suffer defamation. And so in each region, we had experts, including from the, the, the regions concerned, and they came up with an action plan on how to address incitement to racial or religious uh, discrimination and related intolerances. Once again, a good document called the Rabat Plan of Action. This leads me to comment that in a situation such as in Northern Ireland, where you are still dealing with uh, huge differences and divisions, uh, it could be on uh, religious or other grounds, how important it is to have a human rights-based approach where the rights of everyone are respected, the dignity of everyone is respected. And we address issues such as discrimination, violence, uh, and related intolerance through national action plans. I uh, had the privilege of seeing human rights education being taught at some schools. This is, this is where it begins, where children are taught to, to undo these perceptions that have built up of prejudices and suspicion of the other. In the Rwanda tribunal where I sat as a judge, witnesses told us that uh, hate propaganda against the Tutsi was spread uh, over the radio and other and the uh, journals and spread like little drops of petrol all over the country until it caught fire. And this is what makes me say that discrimination, divisions must be addressed because they are alerts to serious conflicts and violence happening later. So these two schools I visited, one was a girls' school in Gaza where the eight-year-olds demonstrated how they resolved disputes amongst themselves. They spoke about respecting each other's dignity and, and a third person interviewing, getting these two uh, quarreling students to talk. I saw uh, such a demonstration on the island of Gori, once again a girls' school, where through art they were expressing the full spectrum of human rights as it appears in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Ireland is a very important member of the United Nations. Ireland can always be trusted to support human rights in the international fora. And the Irish uh, uh, government has provided huge support for the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And so it's my fervent wish that these would be translated locally to build um, a stable, harmonious society here in Ireland. Now, when I first addressed the Human Rights Council, I pledged to embark on an open-minded, frank, and reciprocally uh, reinforcing interaction based on the premise 
that the credibility of human rights work depends on impartiality and commitment to truth and no tolerance for double standards. And of course, this standard is familiar to you, quite unfamiliar in the, in the halls of political discourse in the uh, UN bodies. And I often felt if uh, states adopted this approach uh, of being impar impartial and, and devoted to protecting the human rights of people, instead of uh, fervently adopting their national or regional positions and loyalty, if only they would hold their friends to the same standards as their foes, it would be very helpful. The international community can certain, certainly benefit from such an approach in ensuring peace, security, development, and human rights by prioritizing human rights, by placing people at the center of their deliberations, whether it's climate change, environment, or development. So regrettably, the international community remains unable to react consistently, strongly, and quickly to crises. And, and we now are going through uh, information on our television screens daily of crises happening in many places, Iraq and ISIS, where ISIS offers no choice to individuals except to convert to Islam or be killed. They are selling little girls for $10 each in order to recruit young men to join them. So an appalling situation, but um, the UN is following the situation in the Syrian Arab Republic, Libya, Mali, Central African Republic, the o occupied Palestinian territories, Ukraine, South Sudan, and Cote d'Ivoire. And, and so I, in turn, received uh, many requests from the Security Council to brief them on the human rights situation in these countries. This was very welcome because previously they dealt with peace, security, and development without reference to human rights. And I felt this demonstrates the heightened recognition that human rights are fundamental to peace, security, and development. It is shocking beyond belief that war crimes and crimes against humanity have become commonplace and occur with complete impunity. So I was disappointed that the Security Council, uh, by 13 votes in favor and two against, have been unable to reach agreement on any kind of action to ensure accountability in Syria. So in my final briefing to them, invited by them, I stated that by their failure to agree and act collectively in the face of horrendous violations, they were responsible for the deaths of thousands of people in Syria. Now, next year would be the 70th anniversary of the United Nations, and this is an opportunity for everyone to debate on UN reform, including its structure, including the veto powers held by five uh, states, the need to be more effective and efficient, and also to put the people back into the United Nations. Um, I think my time is about up, up now. I just wanted to mention some future challenges, which is obviously terrorism, but also the measures adopted in counter-terrorism. The UN has very clear rules on counter-terrorism. They cannot violate human rights in the process of uh, uh, attacking terrorism. And um, within and among states, there's acute income inequalities, failures of uh, social and economic governance. So there is a fundamental need for more consistent application of human rights in the economic sphere. All people deserve accountable and democratic governance under the rule of law in developed and developing countries alike. Corruption undermines social justice and the right to participate, uh, to contribute to and enjoy economic, social, and cultural rights. I have recently addressed many universities in South Africa, and they particularly asked me to speak about ethics in the 
public and private sphere because of the alarming incidents of corruption in government and business. Um, it will also be necessary to, stop, to step up our work to maintain the right to privacy in the face of governmental and corporate attempts to create a surveillance society via new technologies. And here, we, uh, the, the office prepared a report in response to a UN General Assembly resolution on the right to privacy in the digital era. So these are my conclusions. And I think these new and emerging issues will need to be addressed by all of us. So, so thank you. And I'll, I'll wait your questions and, of course, your comments. Thank you.